Right, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay, uh, so this is, I'm Will and this is Lucy and this is our presentation on infections of the middle ear. Okay, so today we're going to cover a bit of middle ear anatomy and then use it to explain the pathophysiology of middle ear infections. Um, talk a bit about examination, signs and symptoms of middle ear infections and how they're treated. So first of all, just a brief bit of anatomy. So the middle ear is located in the petrous temporal bone and its function is essentially to convert sound energy into kinetic energy, um, amplifying it in the process so it can get um, interpreted by the internal ear. Um, therefore, middle ear infections commonly present with hearing loss. So for the purposes of middle ear infections, we found this nice analogy, the middle ear is essentially a box. Uh, it's bounded laterally by the tympanic membrane, medially by the round and oval windows which are entrances, entrances into the internal ear, and then superiorly and inferiorly by petrous temporal bone. This is indicated nicely in the diagram. Those four borders I just mentioned are shown by the colourful lines. Um, so anteriorly and posteriorly are both thin walls of petrous temporal bone too. Um, but there are some important openings. For example, anteriorly, there are openings to the eustachian tube and tense tympani. Posteriorly, um, the opening in the petrous temporal bone is the aditus to mastoid antrum. So this provides some important relationships with regards to the spread of infection. So middle ear infections can spread posteriorly by the aditus to mastoid antrum into mastoid air cells causing mastoiditis. If this is uh, left untreated, this can further complicate as osteomyelitis and meningitis. Um, middle ear infections are commonly secondary to upper respiratory tract infections and this is explained by the fact that the eustachian tube is located in the anterior um, border of the middle ear. Finally, this important um, point, the facial canal contains the facial nerve and this is located in the medial and posterior borders of the middle ear and this is, basically means that the middle ear is separated from the facial nerve by just a thin portion of bone so facial nerve damage can be a complication in middle ear infection and especially the cord of tympani can be damaged um, which present, presents as loss of taste in the anterior two thirds of the time. This is again is indicated by this nice diagram. Here, oh I'll get this. Right, this is where the facial nerve runs medially and then posteriorly behind the middle ear. Okay, so the pathophysiology of acute otitis media. As I've said, it's often secondary to upper respiratory tract infections, and this is indicated by the fact that the organisms which most commonly cause it are nasopharyngeal flora, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae. Also, Moxarella catarralis and viral infections can cause middle ear infections. Um, acute otitis media is made more common by eustachian tubus function, and then this also increases the likelihood of it um, becoming acute, uh, uh, chronic otitis media with effusion, otherwise known as glue ear, which Lucy will talk about. Um, so eustachian tube dysfunction can be due to the infection and congestion of the eustachian tube, um, due to adenoid hypertrophy, which is more common in children aged between 3 and 8, um, allergic reactions, so inflammation of the nasal, no, nasopharyngeal mucosa, um, and as I said, um, adenoids can be enlarged in children aged 3 to 8. This coupled with the fact that the eustachian tube is shorter and more horizontal um, in children means that children under the age of 15 are most commonly affected by middle ear infections. Um, so just to reiterate this point, common complications of otitis media, mastoiditis due to spread posteriorly via the oditis to mastoid antrum, which can spread intracranially. Um, this would present as a redness over the mastoid process and inflammation as well, and facial nerve palsy can be a common complication, um, and that would present characteristically with the drooping face. Okay. So we're going to go on now to talk about otitis media with effusion, which is known um, by many people as glue air. So the primary cause of this is eustachian tube dysfunction. And it's really important to recognise that a tight media with effusion isn't an infection itself, although it can have an infective cause or effect, which I'll go on to explain. So the um, basic pathophysiology of it, as I said, is eustachian tube dysfunction, so it's either blocked or failing to open properly. And the usual um, function of the eustachian tube is to equalise the middle ear pressure with um, outside environmental ear atmospheric ear pressure. So if this becomes blocked, you then get negative pressure inside the middle ear, which leads to effusion. So the negative pressure draws a transudate into the um, cavity of the middle ear. 
And then, so this fluid can cause a conductive hearing loss, which I'll go on to explain can have effects in children, especially causing developmental delay. This is also shown by on otoscopy as a retracted tympanic membrane due to the negative pressure. And like I said, it's not necessarily infected, although it does make it more likely to be effect, infected because as with any kind of infection generally, kind of these pathogens tend to like the warm, moist environment that you'll get inside there. So um, with the signs of um, middle ear infections, there is a degree of overlap. So the main kind of differentiating factors between otitis media and glue ear, like I said, isn't necessarily infective, but uh, otitis media is kind of, uh, you'll get a lot of pain associated with it and fever due to the inflammation that you're getting there. And um, it kind of looks kind of red and angry. You will get some slight hearing loss, which is due to pus building up behind the tympanic membrane. And you can see that kind of as a bulging. And um, less commonly, there is painless discharge. And this tends to occur if the tympanic membrane perforates. And then by that point, the pain will subside slightly. So with glue air, um, there tends to be more severe hearing loss. So like I said, with the developmental delay, you've got this buildup of fluid inside the middle ear. Um, and then that's why we take the steps that we do to manage it in children, which I'll go on to later explain. There is some pain as well. You can get associations with tinnitus, so ring in the ear, or problems with balance also. And uh, one thing it is important to take into consideration is often children and babies aren't going to be able to express the symptoms in the way that an older person might be able to. So parents might report that they're kind of tugging their ears or b being irritable, waking up in the night. So that's a really important thing to ask parents about in their history. So examination, so using an otoscope, you'd look into um, in through the external ultrameatus and have a look at the tympanic membrane. So as you can see, on these pictures, these are showing more glue ear here, so um, a retracted tympanic membrane, and here you can see the malleus, so, and then you can kind of see the incus a bit through here as well. In a, with a, um, with um, uh, acute otitis media, the tympanic membrane would typically be bulging, looking quite red as well around the outside. So the treatment for acute otitis media and glue it. Generally, you tend to go for something conservative first, so leave it and kind of see what happens because obviously you get associated complications with kind of going straight down the antibiotic or the surgical route. So, uh, acute tides media usually resolves within three days, glue air usually within six to 12 weeks. And whilst this is occurring, it's good to recommend use of over the counter pain medication such as paracetamol or NSAIDs like ibuprofen. We'll go on to explain about other management. So for acute otitis media you would use antibiotics so there's certain criteria for this. So if the child is below three months of age or if they're below two years of age and they've got an infection in both of their ears. Um, equally then if the symptoms are severe or not resolving quickly enough or like I said if they've got that discharge occurring. So you typically tend to prescribe a treatment of amoxicillin for around five days but kind of first choice you wouldn't want to give antibiotics because you don't want to prescribe them unnecessarily. And then for as a surgical treatment for um, recurrent acute otitis media or with glue air is insertion of grommets. So this is a ventilation tube which is inserted into the tympanic membrane. So it's a small incision, it's a microscopic surgery and this will drain the fluid from the middle ear. So resolving the hopefully resolving problems that a child might have with developmental delay because of fluid buildup, and these tend to fall out with naturally within six to 12 months, so it's a nice treatment there. And that concludes our presentation. Yeah. Thank you.